every single one of them. So uh, you, uh, if, if, if you spend any time around us, you quickly become part of our family. And uh, because of that, when, when family decides to bail on us, no, I'm kidding. Not, <laughs> God moves us on. You know, he has, uh, he has other, uh, other adventures for us and uh, other areas that uh, he, other regions that he occasionally moves us into so we can become a part of other, of other families, see extended family that we didn't realize was there. And, and the Squires, Squires are going to Tennessee, correct? So come on up here, Squires. I'm going to have Katie come up here. We're going to send you out the right way. We want everybody to know that you're, that you're uh, moving out and, uh, and to keep you in prayer. And we don't want people wondering where you are. Like, where, where are the squires? Why don't, why don't you share a little bit about what's going on with you and where you're going? Well, first, I just want to say how much we have appreciated this fellowship and grown. And the Lord has just grown our faith immensely. We've been here about 18 years. The teaching, the, the worship, the ministry opportunities have been amazing. Um, and our children have lived all around the country and we have 10 grandchildren that as a grandma I have wanted to be with them and it's been a dream to be closer to some of them and um, the Lord has just worked out the details for us to move to near Nashville with um, our middle daughter and her children and husband and um, we know there's a church and ministry opportunity down there but we'll miss you all very much. I think that would be our prayer, that the Lord would pave our way both into a new home and to find a church home, okay, once we get situated down there. This has been a pretty special place. We've been here. We, we brought up in Rochester, but we uh, lived in other areas for over 20 years, came back to Rochester in 2000 and visited different churches. And in the summer of 2000, we came to Bethel and just knew this is where we belong. And the spirit of the Lord is just so present, you know, and the grace of God just pours out abundantly, and the love and the friendship that we've enjoyed here is just something that we just won't forget, and we just thank you all very, very much. Uh, you know, God bless you all, and uh, wish us luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, not luck. <laughs> I just want to say, um, today, talking about um, faith, there are so many things that have happened in our life the last few years with our family here that... Our dream was to go with our kids, and it was like, Lord, is this what you want? But he has done immeasurably more than all we could have asked or imagined in preparing us and, and making a way for us. So just trust him. <laughs> Amen. I want to read from Acts 13.1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Set apart for me Nancy and Bob for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid, laid their hands on them and sent them off. So would you stretch your hands with us, and we want to lay our hands and send you off. Lord, I thank you for the faithfulness of Bob and Nancy in our congregation. They have been faithful members of our family, good and holy and righteous people that have been an example to many. And Bob, you've done good work at Hope Initiatives and as ushers in our congregation and, and just the many ways that you have been um, good people, and we want to send you off. Lord, we bless them. We anoint them with joy and peace and provision, all that they are needed, all that is needed for the journey. We ask that you would send angels ahead of them to prepare the way, prepare their home in Tennessee, including their church home, that, Lord, there is a place that will receive them that is needing exactly what Bob and Nancy have to offer, and we thank you for that. And in the name of Jesus, we send them off with all our blessings and our love and our peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Our, ho our home is running a couple of weeks behind as far as getting in. It's because they hit rock when they were doing the foundation. They had to jackhammer rock away. So we're going to put this thing on the wall that says this house is built upon the rock which shall not fall. Amen. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, rock is good to build a foundation on. Yeah. Amen. Apostle Ron, it's all yours. Say this with me. Our Father.
which art in heaven. Who is he? Our Father. It's a good place to begin. Understand that. Because uh, if you can't understand, you can, <coughs> he's, not, he's more than our creator. He's our Father. He's the one who made us in his image. Hallowed be thy name. What is his name? What is his name? Come on, what is his name? Jehovah, Yahweh. That's his name. But that's too simple. My name is Ron. But when you look at me, there's a whole lot more than Ron says. Why? Because we're all complex. We have, all have so many qualities. You know, we, we name people whatever we want to name them now. Whatever sounds good, you know, uh, to the person. We pick their middle name to make sure it rhymes somewhat with the first name. Uh, I mean, names don't mean a lot. In the Bible, they did because the name was actually almost a prophecy of who the person was. Jehovah is a complex name because he is so much more. How do we hallow the name of the Lord? Have you ever thought about it? Our Father which in heaven holy be your name? It is. But is it to you? Is it to me? The Bible says those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. You can know him by his name as he reveals himself to us in the word. And thank God, he will be for you whatever you need him to be, whenever you need him to be that. Aren't you glad? It's true. Whatever you find you need in any point in life, you can be sure God will be that for you. Because that's his nature. When you know the name of the Lord and all he stands for, everything that happens in life, somehow you see. Everything that happens in life, God is with you. He always will be. I want to look at Psalms 23 today, but I want to look at it a little bit differently because I want to begin to unfold for you all that God is. All that his name implies can be seen in Psalms 23. The first four verses, the psalmist David is talking about God. The first three verses, he's talking about God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. It's like he's talking to somebody else about how good the Lord is to him. But when he gets to the tough places in life, yea, though I walk through the valley of death, he starts talking to God, not to you. You see, there's a shift there. So I'm only going to get through verse 3 today, but I want you to discover with me that wherever we are in life, God is wanting to be what we need. If we can see that he is that to us at that time, we can journey Successfully. Let's start with his first Jehovah name. Jehovah Rahi. And my Hebrew, if you know Hebrew, if it doesn't sound like it, just give me a break. <laughs> All right. Jehovah Rahi. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. But who is the Lord? What's his character? Does he have adequate credentials for me to make him my shepherd, my manager, and my owner? Because if you don't know, the shepherd has authority over the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. It's kind of like David, the psalmist David was saying, you know who my shepherd is? Who's your shepherd? My shepherd is the Lord himself. You know, that, that God, that Lord who is God, that God who made us, 
even though we thought we made ourselves. We are his people in the sheep of his pasture. Colossians 1, 12 through 15, I give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and placed us in the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were made by him and for him. The one who made everything and the one who made everyone and the one who made you and me. That's my shepherd. Who's yours? The statement implies a profound relationship between a mere mortal human being and his creator. It links a lump of clay made alive by the breath of God to the one who spoke it and spoke him or her into existence. So David spoke it with a sense of pride and admiration. It was like he was boasting to those who would hear, the Lord's my shepherd. Who's in charge of your life? Who runs your life? Who's watching out for you? Hopefully it's somebody other than yourself. The Lord is my shepherd. Do I really belong to him? Do I lead in the way I believe I should go or do I let him lead in the way he knows I should go? Do I find comfort in his love? What gives him to the right to be my shepherd beyond the fact that he made me? I'm the good shepherd, Jesus says. I give my life for my sheep. Say this with me, if you would, please. Jehovah Rai. I confess, just read it with me, all right? You don't have to repeat it. Let's read it together. I confess that like a sheep, I have often gone astray, and I have often turned to my own way, that my stubbornness, rebellion, and doubt has often kept me from following you. I need your shepherding. I surrender my will to yours and place my life under your caring love and proudly declare to the world and all who will hear the Lord, come on, say it again, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. Can't you tell he's impressed? There's so much more I could say. But that really says it all. The Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Rahi. It goes on to say, because he is my shepherd. This is the psalmist David. Because he is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's quite a statement. How can I say that? See, the main concept of that statement is that of lacking nothing that you really need when you're under the care and the shepherding of the Lord. That's why he says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. Let's turn there quickly. If you have your Bible, turn there. John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I give my life for my sheep.
beginning with verse 11. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Now, a hireling, he who isn't really the shepherd, just hired to watch over them, one who doesn't own them, when he sees the wolf coming, he'll leave the sheep and run for his own life. And the wolf will catch the sheep and scatter the flock. The hireling flees because he's a hireling. He doesn't care about the sheep. He just wants to keep his job and his life. By the way, that's an ad lib if you don't know. <laughs> I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep. And my sheep know who I am. And the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is always including in what he's doing the knowledge of I'm doing the Father's will. And because I do the Father's will, I lay down my life for my sheep. And other sheep I have which are also not of this fold, them also I must bring. They will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. My Father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. John 10, he describes the difference between a true shepherd and a hireling. Hon, would you give me that book that's there? Is it there someplace? No, it's here. <laughs> Just wanted you to look. I want to read something from a book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. It's an Australian by the name of W. Philip Keller. And he wrote a book entitled, and you may want to get this book, A, Psalm, a Shepherd Looks at Psalms 23. In his book, he talks about the difference between a shepherd and someone who's just hired to watch after the sheep. <clears throat> And he, I'm just looking here. Hang on. I'll find my place. He talks about a rancher who had, he was a sheep rancher, but he wasn't the owner of the ranch. He was a servant that was hired to keep the sheep. But even the rancher next door treated his sheep very much differently than he treated his. And uh, the pastures were not lush and green. The sheep were, were uh, not well cared for and watched after. And uh, his only concern was well, how much they could bring him when it came time for them to be either sheared or slaughtered. And he, in his book, describes the difference between his sheep and his neighbor's sheep. In John chapter 10, Jesus describes a yearning in his heart for all those who will hear him and respond to his care. Because in the eyes of Jesus, nothing brings more satisfaction and joy of seeing the sheep contented, well-fed, safe, flourishing under his care. That's what God desires for you. He wants you to flourish under his care. Psalms 1 describes such a person. Who can quote it for me? Blessed is the man who walks not after the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living for water, bringing forth fruit in its season. But the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Blessed is the man who knows Christ as a shepherd. Blessed is the woman who knows Christ as their shepherd. Blessed is the man or the woman whose delight is in the word of God. And in the word of God, he meditates day and night. He shall be, she shall be like a tree planted by living water that brings forth his fruit in the season. Do you know how delighted it makes Jesus 
when you begin to flourish as you meditate in his word and you walk in his ways. Compared to the sheep, have, have a different shepherd and have no one who cares for them like Jesus cares for you. Another way to look at it is through the eyes of the sheep themselves, not the shepherd and the delight he has in seeing his sheep prosper, but also through the eyes of the sheep themselves. Don't you want to be that man or that woman who is blessed in all their ways? This verse, I shall not want, means I don't have a lot of unfilled desire since Jesus became my Lord and Shepherd. I don't have things that I just am itching to have and pursue. Nothing holds me in its grip as much as he holds me in his love. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be fully satisfied in the blessing of his care. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. See, we have to understand this. Where's the first time in the Bible God reveals him, God the Father reveals himself by Jehovah Jireh? Does anyone know? Where? Where? By the name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. On Mount Moriah. When Abraham is going to offer a sacrifice to God. God tells him, and this is tough. When you read it, you say, I can't believe God would do this. But God tells Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son of promise, Isaac, and I want you to take him up into the mountain, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice to me. Why would God do that? That doesn't sound like a good shepherd. Listen, good shepherds even lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because as he leads us through the valley, it is not to our destruction but to our enlargement. We go through difficult times. Sometimes even in the difficult times, it's the Lord that is leading us through them. Verses 1 through 3 that I'm going to share with you today, David's talking to everybody about who God is, but when he gets through the valley of the shadow of death, he starts talking to God himself because hey, I don't need to talk about God here. I need to talk to God about being here, you know? Yea, though I walked, now that's, oh, can't go there. That's way beyond where we need to be today. But he's the Lord that provides. So Abraham's on his way up to the mountain. He gathers wood. He builds an altar, puts the wood in the fire, lays his son on the altar, and, and would follow through in what God asked him. Why? Why would he do that? Because he knew that God would never ask him to do something that would deny the fulfillment of the promise that he made. He says, well, if I slay him, God will raise him up again, you know. So he gets ready to do that, and all of a sudden, the Lord provides a ram caught by his horns in the thicket. And he says, slay not your son. I don't ask you to make a sacrifice that I don't supply the sacrifice for. God will never ask you to do anything that he doesn't give you the ability and the resource to accomplish. The shepherd doesn't ask you to do impossible things. He asks you, just trust me. Jesus would say today, if I'm your shepherd, just trust me. Yeah, even in the valley of the shadow of death. The Lord provides. Come on, say it again. The Lord provides. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord provides. Say this with me if you would, please. All right? Let's loudly. I confess that any lack I have stems from my unbelief and not your lack of faithfulness. 
You never ask of me that which you don't first supply. I thank you, Father, that I am free from the curse of poverty. You have qualified me to receive the inheritance of the kingdom of life. You supply all of my needs, not according to my education, ability, or earning potential, but according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I'm going to redo some of these declarations before we get done. But it's true. He's Jehovah Jireh. What's it going to say? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. What kind of picture does that present to you? He makes me lie down in green pasture. What? Peace. Peace. Jehovah Shalom. Peace. <clears throat> the strange thing about sheep is because of their gentle and timid nature, by the way, turn to your neighbor and say, you're just a sheep. Now turn back to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad that you're not my shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> Strange thing about sheep is because they're gentle, timid nature, it's almost impossible for them to lie down and rest unless several requirements are met for them. Number one, sheep will never lie down if they are not free from fear, tension, pest-like aggravation, hunger, or thirst. Freedom from the fear of other animals that would devour them, freedom from the friction that is caused by other sheep in the fold, freedom from the torment of flies and insects and parasites and freedom from hunger and thirst. It is only the shepherds themselves that can release the sheep from these fears. It's the caring shepherd who makes it possible for the sheep to lie down and rest, to relax and be quietly content. Philip Keller shares that in the course of time, as he learned how to shepherd sheep, he came to realize that nothing would reassure and quiet the sheep as much as to see him in the field and hear the comforting sound of his voice. As we examine each of these four factors that affect sheep so severely, we will see why this is so. The fear of being attacked by other animals. Even a jackrabbit. I live on a corner where lady across the street, elderly lady, uh, I just see her go out every night, now in her walker, uh, frail and bent over, but she goes out with her walker every night, pushing her walker through the pasture to go out and see her sheep. It's a wonderful sight. I love, I love it there as I pull out of my yard every time I look across the road or out of my road I see all these sheep there and I see the care that she has for them but do you know that e even a jackrabbit suddenly hopping out from behind a bush could stampede a whole flock of sheep you know uh, Philip Keller tells a story of, of a lady friend who came to visit them from the city uh, to his sheep ranch in Australia uh, she got there, pulled up right there near the sheepfold, and uh, opened the door of her car, and out jumped this ferocious Pekingese. <laughs> How many of you know a Pekingese is much more ferocious than its size? <laughs> and that thing jumped out of it and ran toward the sheep, barking, and he said, all 200 of my sheep ran together across the field and huddled in fear on the other side of the pasture. They're timid. As long as there's the slightest suspicion of danger from dogs, coyotes, cougars, lions, bears, or any other enemies, the sheep stand up ready to flee for their lives. When they are afraid and sense fear, they will not lie down. <clears throat> Generally, it's the unexpected and unknown that causes them the greatest panic. 
But it's in these times we, as God's children and God's sheep, go to the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to comfort our hearts with the knowledge that Christ is with us. Even as the shepherd is with his sheep and only the shepherd can bring them calm and help them rest and relax, God is with us. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. If you're overwhelmed with fear, that is not Jesus. It is the enemy of your soul. He wants to keep you so riled up you can't lie down and rest and relax. And I say to you today, he is not your shepherd. Jesus is chill out. I don't care what is tormenting you today. It is not Jesus, your shepherd's will, for you to be ill at ease and all messed up in your soul. Come on, take hold of your soul and get it in the line with Jesus, who's your shepherd. Don't let your soul ruin your relationship with your shepherd. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. The second source of fear from the shepherd, from which the shepherd delivers his sheep, is the tension of having to be in a flock with other sheep. Look around you. Look around you. Who's been butting you lately? You know, in... In every part of the animal kingdom, there's an established order of dominance or status within it. Who does he think she is? Who does he think, I mean, who does he think she is? No. Who does he think he is? Who does she think she is? Come on. I'll tell you who he thinks she is. Pretty nice. Okay, moving on. With hens, it's called the what? Pecking order. You ever seen hens go after other hens? They'll peck them to death. Dominance. If you get, how many ever raised hens? You know what I mean, right? David's had them, Ron's had them. With, with cattle, it's the horning order. With sheep, it's the budding order. Generally, an arrogant, cunning, and domineering old ewe will be boss of the whole bunch of sheep. She maintains her position by budding and driving the other ewes or lambs away from the best grazing and favorite bed grounds. Succeeding her in precise order are all the other sheep who are establishing and maintaining their positions. Come on, give me a break. Just say the shepherd's made a place for us all, and let's not butt one another, all right? Come on, don't keep up with the Joneses. That's, you know, that has no end. Just be who God created you to be. Use the gifts that God has given you. Get along with the people next to you and say, don't butt me anymore. No, just say, how can I help you? Come on. Order in the church. Come on. Let's not let offense keep us apart from one another. Let's not worry, well, that person has this responsibility and that person has that to be honest. I just soon hear most of you preach rather than myself sometimes. Come on. Let, we're in this thing together. We're all members of this flock. We're here for one another. So, but let's move on. I, I can't do, uh, I got to finish it. The third force of fear, source of fear is tormented parasites and insects. Sheep, especially in the summer, can be driven to distraction by nasal flies. Oh, doesn't that sound good? Nasal flies, <laughs> bot flies, warble flies, and ticks. Warble flies, I don't know what they are. It sounds horrible, doesn't it? Sheep, especially in the summer, are tormented them. And when they're tormented by these pests, they can't lie down and rest. Instead, they are on their feet, stamping their legs, shaking their heads, ready to run off into to the dense bush just for relief. A good shepherd will apply various types of insect repellent and, and uh, ointment to his sheep. He will dip their fleece to free them of ticks. He will see sh that there are shelter belts of trees and bush where they can find refuge from their tormentors. This requires considerable care and money. This shepherd has to be among sheep daily. He has to keep a close watch on their behavior. Remember, it's the Lord himself who is your shepherd. He, he's here. He wants us to learn 
how to walk with him and with one another at the same time. The fourth source of fear is just hunger and thirst. It's not generally recognized that many of the great sheep countries of the world are semi-arid and very dry. In fact, that is really the best environment for the sheep to grow up in. But green pastures are essential, and green pastures don't grow themselves in semi-arid land. It is the shepherd's responsibility to search out where the pastures are or to make the ground where he has his flock flourish and nurture when lambs are maturing and ewes uh, are, are, are bearing them, they need green succulent feed for milk flow and for honey, good pasture. That's what is required. And so the psalmist says, I can be at peace because he leads me in green pastures and beside still waters. Although sheep thrive in dry, semi-arid countries, they require a great deal of water. I'm just talking about sheep today uh, because uh, there's a lesson for us to learn. The key is to where the water can be obtained lies with the shepherd. He has to lead them to the places where their thirst can be satisfied. In fact, often these watering places are made possible only by the hard work and faithfulness of the shepherd. Generally speaking, water for sheep come from three sources, dew on the grass, deep wells, and springs and streams. Sheep can actually go for months on end without drinking if the weather is not too hot and there's heavy dew on the grass every morning. Sheep by habit rise just before dawn and start to feed. And even if there's bright moonlight, they'll feed at night. And the early hours of the morning are when vegetation is drenched with dew, and these are the still waters that are mentioned in this text. In my experience, Christians who are most at peace, most filled with faith and trust, most able to cope with what life brings, are those who ride early and feed on the precious dew of the Word of God. Understand something. You are His sheep and the only fit pasture for you to grow and mature, to trust in His care, is His Word. Without it, you'll starve. These people come away from these hours of meditation, reflection, and communion with Christ refreshed in their mind and their spirit. Marge Anderson, I didn't know this until lately, but she would rise every day and spend hours in the Word of God. And when it came to a very narrow place when she was walking through the valley of the shadow of death, she had absolute peace in Christ. Believed Him, but had no fear. Worshipped Him in the midst of it all. What a testimony. Thank you, Ken, for sharing that with me. It's kind of revolutionizing my life a little bit. I want to spend more time with him so that I can be at rest in my soul and not all uptight with the things that are happening around me, just fully trusting and resting in him. Peace. The Lord is my peace. John 14, 27, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
not the kind of peace the world gives, but the peace that only I can give. So don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. And then Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The more you fill your mind and your heart with Jesus Christ and his word, the more you can trust in him. Say this with me. Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord my peace. The Lord my peace. I confess that like a sheep I often go astray. I have turned my, to my own way. In my stubbornness, rebellion, and doubt, they have often kept me from following you. I need a shepherd to lead and guide me. Say this with me. Thank you, Father. Come on, let's say it together. Thank you, Father. You are my shepherd in Jesus by your spirit. You lead me in green pastures of abundance. Go ahead, just keep reading out loud. Start, you lead. Okay, say it with me. Jehovah Shalom. I repent of worry and anxiety for allowing my mind to dwell on my problems rather than your love and greatness. I thank you, Father, that you have promised to keep me in perfect peace when I fix my thoughts on you. Thank you, Jesus, for being my peace. Make me a peacemaker and cause even my enemies to be at peace with me. Where did I get that one? Moving on. He restores the Lord my righteousness. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Jehovah Sid Canoe. Remember this psalm about the shepherd's great care of the sheep? Why would one of the sheep ever become so distressed? in soul that he would need to be restored. He restores my soul. See, this is important. We have to understand this. The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want, because he makes me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside still water as my provider. And as my righteousness, he restores my soul. This is about the shepherd's great care of the sheep. Even the writer of this psalm, King David, was familiar with this sense of distress and fatigue. Why would one of his sheep ever become so distressed in his soul that he would need to be restored? Do you remember what the psalmist wrote in Psalms 42, verse 11? Let me read it for you. Why are you so cast down, my soul? Why are you so disquieted in me? Hope in God. This is David. This is the same one who writes Psalms 23. He was going through a difficult time in his life. He, was, he, had, he had tasted defeat at times in his life. He knew what it meant to be cast down in his soul and dejected and depressed. He, he, that's why he says it. This is an exact parallel to what he is feeling in his shepherd's care for his sheep. The word cast down. Why are you so cast down? Do you know that sheep can be cast down? How many of you are ever aware of that? That sheep can actually be cast down? Well, I thought they don't have soulless nature. How can they be cast down? A cast sheep is a sheep who seeks comfort in a hollow spot in the ground. And the sheep lays down and rolls onto its side. Oh, this feels good. But he rolls a little bit too far. And his legs are no longer touching the ground. It's a cast sheep. It brings a sense of alarm and fear in his comfort, in the sheep's comfort. It brings a, 
a little bit of an alarm of fear. The cast sheep is a pathetic sight. He's lying on his back, feet up in the air, just frantically trying to right itself. I, I was going to bring you a video, but it was, it's just incredible. He's laying on his back. He, he was laying on his side. He rolled over too far. His legs are straight up in the air, and he can't get himself up. He can't get himself back. His, his, his four legs are useless to him. He's just fa- flailing there. And as he does, and the more he struggles, the more the gases begin to expand in his rumen, whatever that is. But in his rumen, it, those gases begin to expand and they cut off the circulation of his blood to his extremities of a a sheep that becomes cast. A shepherd knows this. This is one of the most dangerous things for his sheep is to become cast, to become so comfortable and that it can no longer get up on its feet. In a hot, humid day, a sheep can die in just a couple hours when he finds himself in a cast position. In, in a cool day, a cloudy day, a rainy day, uh, a sheep can last for days in that condition. And, and the shepherd w- will daily watch for a sheep. I would watch this little elderly lady with her walker go out to her sheep every evening. And, uh, and she would be there for a while, and then she would be coming back again. What was she doing? She was checking for her sheep. Now, if she ever had a cast sheep, I don't know how she ever could have righted it because the shepherd is the only one. The cast sheep can't help itself when a sheep becomes cast and depressed. The shepherd will have to come up, roll the sheep over, and eventually help that sheep, if it's been in that way for very long, to stand. And it can hardly stand because there's been no circulation in the legs, and it straddles the sheep and, and rubs the sheep's legs to cause the circulation to flow. And, and as he senses the sheep is beginning to regain its strength, he lets it go, and it goes staggering off in the distance. This is what it means. Why are you so disquieted, my soul? You know, David got himself in a place where he just felt so out of touch with the Lord. It, it, his soul was just bringing him into a place where he was questioning until he finally... See, the sheep can't help itself, but you and I are different. We can help ourselves. When we get ourselves in a funk and we realize that we are in a state where our soul is dictating to us who we are, what we can do, what we should be doing, where should we should be going. It's up to you and I to take the word of God that we've been feeding on and say, soul, straighten up. Straighten up. Thoughts, Straighten up. Get in alignment with the Word of God. I know the Word of God, and I know who my shepherd is, and he will not let me be destroyed. You see, what a beautiful picture it is. As with sheep, so with Christians. It's some basic parallels apply that help us become aware. Why do we get in those funky places in our soul? In the Christian life, there's great danger in always looking for the easy place, the cozy corner the comfortable position where there's never any hardship or demand for self-discipline, a life of self-indulgence. Then there's the fact of having too much wool. Sometimes sheep become cast because their fleece becomes long, heavily matted with burrs, manure, and other debris, weighed down by its own wool. The wool is, is, a, is a type of the self-life in the Word of God. So the more we feed ourselves, the more we get take on the weight of the world. Why do you think it is that the writer of the Hebrew says, you got a whole cloud of witnesses looking after you. So come on, get up. Lay aside the weights that so easily beset you and run with patience the race that is set before you. Let go of some of this baggage that you're putting on. Get free of it. And let's move on in Christ. So what's the what's shepherd do? With a sheep that's becoming cast because her fleece and her wool is so heavy. What's he do? 
He takes out the shears and he cuts off the wool. No. Sharp two edged sword. Say, how do I cut off this stuff that's getting me into this funky place? With the Word of God, that's how you cut it off. Come on, I'm telling you right now. God, if you know the Word of God, you'll be able to get yourself out of that hole. But it's only the Word of God that's going to help you get out of it. Come on, stop. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Quit, quit letting the enemy have his way. Quit letting your soul depress you and take advantage. Take the word of God and use it as a sharp two-edged sword so he can divide asunder from soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Come on. The word of God is the word of the shepherd to us that keeps us moving in the right place. I've got to end. He will always lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. Say this with me, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord is my righteousness. Ready? Okay, good, we're on the right page. I repent, come on, I repent of my feeble attempts to gain right standing with you for my lack of confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for making me righteous in Jesus. You made him who knew no sin to be sin for me so that I might be the righteousness of God in him. Thank you. I don't have to work for it. I'm righteous because I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. You know, Sometimes we think the people who get themselves in a mess get their shepherd upset with them. But a shepherd doesn't get upset with a sheep. He's always. Because it's not their doing what is right or doing what is wrong that makes a difference. It's his care for them that makes the difference. We've all seen people, as we've walked with the Lord, go through so many different things. We ourselves have gone through them. I remember we've walked, I remember we've walked with uh, Frank and Judy Cruz for years, right? I loved her husband, great brother in Christ. But he went through a difficult time in his life, and he lost his job, and he lost his health. He had some form of cancer, right? Had to go through some extreme surgeries and had a great deal of pain, and so had to take painkillers. I first met her husband when he was in Teen Challenge. He had overcome his addictions and he was, he married. Judy stood by him during all that time. I can remember she would come to visit him and be here. And I remember the kids growing up. Uh, Frank, through the things he had gone through, just his soul got a hold of him. And, uh, and the painkillers got a hold of him, and he began to go back to that old lifestyle. I got a call from Judy one day, and I said, I found Frank upstairs. He's gone. I remember going to her house and uh, being with them there as we waited for the coroner to come. And you think, Lord, weren't you there? He was there. He was there. 
Frank had gotten into a place where he became chaos. And struggled, but he couldn't help himself. But the Lord was there. We did what we could to help him. Jesus was always there. He'd never turned away. You know what I realized this morning, Judy? Here's what I realized. Jesus was there, and when he took his last breath, the angels transported him into the very presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, the devil never wins when Jesus is our shepherd. Jesus was with Frank through all of those years of his struggle. Aaron passed recently. He was with Aaron. I know. You say, how do you know the angels transported? Well, remember the, the beggar who tried to get some food from the rich man? The beggar dies. The rich man dies. Nobody knows how the rich man gets to where he went, his place of torment. But the Bible is very careful to say the angels carried that poor beggar to Abraham's bosom. You see, God is with us, so don't judge what it looks like on the outside. Don't judge the outcome by outward appearances. When a person has met Jesus Christ, they've come in touch with a shepherd who will never leave them or forsake them, no matter how difficult that would be. I mean, look at David. What a mess he was. Look at him. You know, he's a man that couldn't keep his passions in check, has an illicit sexual affair with a man's wife, and then to hide it, killed, has the husband killed in battle. You know? And uh, God eventually exposes it when God does. He repents. Look at David, that kind of man. It, he's saying, why are you so disquieted, disquieted, O my soul? Hope thou in God. God never took his throne from him. God never left him. God... God was faithful to him, and, and because God's faithfulness and because of who was guiding him through all of these things, Jesus Christ is the shepherd that you and I enjoy today. Come on, let's stop looking through the eyes of, of the world, and let's start looking through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Let's not see the worst that's in someone. Just let's see that we all belong to the Lord. He is our shepherd. And as we walk together, we shall not want he will will lead us beside still waters and green pastures. And he will be everything that we need. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're going through. But I know this. If Jesus is your shepherd, he's there with you in the middle of it all. He's with you. Would you just personally, just thank God. How many of you say the Lord's my shepherd? Would you just personally worship him and trust him to see you through wherever you are? David or anything else?